Welcome to Brace Wells webinar on export controls and sanctions. Today for our discussion is joining us is Seth Ducharme and Robert Dugan. Robert Dugan is the acting special agent in charge of the Miami field office for the U.S. Department of Commerce Office of Export Enforcement, where he's responsible for overseeing all export investigations for Florida. Bob began his career with the United States Customs Service, which is now part of Homeland Security, where he worked for seven years as an agent to help stop the flow of illegal narcotics into the United States. After uh, the U.S. Uh, Customs Service, he spent the last 19 years with the Enforcement Division of the Department of Commerce. He started as a special agent and then became assistant special agent in charge in the New York field office, where he was responsible for uh, investigations of export uh, control violations for New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and was most recently assigned to the Miami office, where he is now the acting special agent in charge. Seth Ducharme is a partner with Bracewell in our New York office, and he's in the firm's government enforcement and investigations practice. Before joining Bracewell, Seth was the uh, was in the prestigious U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, where, among other positions, he served as Chief of the Criminal Division, Chief of the National Security and Cybercrime Section, and was, uh, but right before joining Bracewell, the Acting United States Attorney. Seth also served as Senior Counselor to the Attorney General of the United States for Criminal national security and cyber matters, and then was later named as the principal associate deputy attorney general in the United States, where he worked with the deputy attorney general to oversee all the department's litigating and law enforcement components. Robert and Seth, thanks for joining us today. Great to see you, Matthew. Thank you. Well, uh, let's just start off with, uh, you know, today I think we're going to talk about some uh, more pressing, you know, issues in the news, especially relating to the sanctions uh, uh, imposed on Russia for its actions against Ukraine. But before we get there, let's just, you know, step back a little bit. And for uh, our viewers who maybe aren't as in the weeds on uh, export controls and sanctions laws, let's just talk a little bit about what that is and what that means. Uh, so, Bob, you know, I, I Gave kind of a Robert, excuse me. I gave you a, a long laundry list of your uh, roles with the Department of Commerce, but but talk to us a little bit about what is the Office of Enforcement and what does the Department of Commerce do with it relates to exports? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, as a special agent with the U.S. Department of Commerce Office of Export Enforcement, we are the law enforcement arm of the bureau. Um, the Office of Export Enforcement falls under the Bureau of Industry and Security. Uh, and the Department of Commerce is an agency that it was uh, formed to promote commerce, uh, items being exported from the United States and items that are, are subject to export licensing jurisdiction. Um, along with that jurisdiction comes uh, individuals and companies, uh, depending on what commodities are being exported from the United States, they have to apply for export licenses. Where the where special agents come into into play, uh, we basically investigate individuals and companies that knowingly violate the export administration regulations by sending items from the United States that would require an export license, uh, either to our foreign adversaries, uh, to countries that would require an export license because of current sanctions, uh, and our investigators are basically out there to try and uh, stop the illegal flow of of um, exports to basically our adversaries uh, and individuals that basically uh, would hurt the national security of the United States. Okay. And, and Seth, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you were in various roles with the Department of Justice. You know, how does uh, the work that Robert and, and the other people at the Department of Commerce are doing, uh, how does that interact with the uh, goals and the policies of the Department of Justice? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. So, you know, I'll, I'll come at that question, I guess, from from two points of view. You know, the first, uh, when I worked as a line prosecutor in a national security section, trying to make uh, these criminal cases uh, with agents like uh, Robert and, and his colleagues and, and how those cases get put together. And then also talk about, you know, on the policy level with the Department of Justice and the other executive branch agencies, uh, how they work together. Um, to 
promote those enforcement policies. So on the line level, how the case gets made in an export control or a sanctions case depends upon, of course, what the administration has designated uh, as a uh, as an individual, you know, or entity, as Robert mentioned, who is a prohibited or scrutinized entity, you know, such that shipping goods or uh, engaging in U.S. dollar transactions, um, you know, or otherwise supporting that entity could run afoul of 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 the uh, of the criminal laws. And the sanctions regime is a, is an unusual one compared to other types of federal criminal uh, laws in that. Uh, it moves quickly because it essentially flows from executive order. So the president of the United States, um, you know, designates a particular country uh, uh, as a as a destination point that deserves higher scrutiny. The EO through the Code of uh, Federal Regulations and ultimately Title Fifty uh, in the International Emergency Economic Powers Act turns essentially, you know, an executive order. Uh, into a federal statutory violation down the road. And, it, and it's a pretty nimble process, much more nimble, I think, than, than other areas of government. Uh, f- for example, when we've legislated you know, federal criminal violations, here in the national security realm, um, it's an area where the government you know, can be more nimble, is more nimble, uh, and, and moves more quickly, as we've seen from all the Russian sanctions that have flowed on a near daily basis, you know, over the last few months. So I think that's the first thing, you know, that that the audience needs to understand. It's an administration identifying a national security and foreign policy issue, which then gets incorporated uh, into other laws and statutes and can turn into a federal criminal violation. And so, uh, you know, when you start out in an investigation, you know, it's it's all about the you know the 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 who and the what is involved in the transaction. So attribution of counterparties really important. For example, Russian oligarchs have been top of the headlines lately. You know, who are you doing business with, and then what uh, 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 is 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 the material of the transaction? Whether that's controlled technologies or you know banking U.S. dollars, but you know what is is at issue. Um, and so, you know, on the line level, teams of federal prosecutors work with teams of agents, you know, Robert was a, and is a subject matter expert in some of these controlled technologies. And you see the intersection of policy law and technology in a lot of these cases to figure out, you know, how aggressively a case should be prosecuted or what enforcement remedies should be brought. That's sort of what happens, you know, in the field in a small team level. The highest levels of government, all this work needs to be coordinated so that the U.S. government across agencies is kind of speaking with one voice and working in a complementary way. I mean, when, when we did the uh, and, and we won't talk much about it because it's an ongoing case, but the Huawei case, for example, uh, which the office brought working with Commerce, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York brought a few years ago. You know, on its face, that was a case about bank fraud and Iranian sanctions uh, theft of intellectual property. But on a policy level, you know, one can imagine how, you know, that implicated U.S. foreign policy, U.S. trade with China, uh, um, the technical infrastructure of the United States, our relationship with foreign partners who might rely on that same backbone. So in sanctions enforcement, I think more so than most other areas of criminal law enforcement, um, you know, the whole of government leadership really needs to be thinking about, you know, is the Commerce Department working in a complementary way with the Treasury Department and the State Department and the Justice Department, uh, all of whom, you know, are well informed by, you know, the intelligence community across all agencies so that, um, you know, all of the government efforts uh, are really are synchronized. And you don't inadvertently, uh, you know, do something that that's prejudicial somehow to a foreign policy agenda or a national security agenda, you know, or a law enforcement agenda. Um, it does move faster, I think, uh, for some of the reasons I, I mentioned, you know, than other areas. But you can imagine, Matthew, having all those stakeholders, you know, around the table to find alignment where you have the Commerce Department, the State Department, Justice Department, the intelligence community all saying, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's move forward together. 
think moments like now or with the Russian conflict in Ukraine, that's a good example, I think, of where you will find alignment uh, right. amongst government agencies and you will see, a, you know, an aggressive m- move on technologies, U.S. dollars, weapons. Um, but it's not always it's not always uh, it's not always so easy uh, to, to carve that out. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting intersection. And I'm, I don't know if there's an equivalent, right, of where you have politics and national security and law and compliance for companies and then trying to then overlay that with our allies overseas and what they're doing. Because, you know, speaking of Russia, for instance, you know, you have allies such as Germany who have such a, a higher dependence on Russian oil for their energy needs than the U.S. And so trying to figure out how to uh, make all of that work um, without doing anything to harm our allies, um, help support them so that they don't have any unintended consequences. It's just really an interesting kind of this confluence of all of these um, different segments of the of the government. Yeah, agree agree completely. So. so, Seth, this is a, a pretty complicated area. Uh, there are a lot of different laws and agencies that are involved. Um, so, I, I, you know, certainly in the time that we have, we could spend the rest of the day talking about it. But could you just give our uh, our viewers just a you know an overview? Because you mentioned commerce, you mentioned the Treasury and the State Department. Um, we've talked about some of the regulations and some of the laws. Could you just give us a you know? you know, a reader's digest version, maybe that's an outdated reference of, uh, not of to what me. These, yeah. Right. To all of us, <laughs> maybe our viewers as well. Uh, could you just give us a, get an overview of how these different agencies are, what they're involved in, you know, in overseeing what laws are in, impacted here and, and how those work together? Sure. And, um, you know, on the investigative level, just on the, as on the policy level, often the agencies will work together in kind of ad hoc or official task forces. When Robert and I were working together, we often had partners from the FBI or Homeland Security Investigations who, who were part of the teams. Um, because as you pointed out, it really is kind of a sub, an area that requires a fair amount of subject matter ex- expertise on both the law uh, and the technology. And it also requires a fair, you know, a fair amount of international um, understanding Um, you know, outside the borders of the United States. So I guess just a quick overview to help our our audience issue spot in their own matters. Um, uh, You know, IEPA, the uh, International Emergency Economic Powers Act, I mean, emergency and economic should be words that that jump out, I I think, to the audience, um, because our you know, our clients are in the business of, uh, you know, selling services and products, often internationally. Compliance is a necessary part of their existence, but nobody goes into business just to be compliant, <laughs> right? You go into business to, to sell your goods and, and, and make your investors, uh, you know, s- some money and to, and, 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 to, and to provide a good, a good product. But I think you have to look at the nature of your business in the first instance to figure out where one of these agencies might pop up unexpectedly in your life. Um, you know, are, are you a manufacturer or distributor of uh, technologies which could have application uh, in national security, even if that's not your intent. I mean, one of the more common examples is carbon fiber, you know, used in golf clubs, also used in, you know, nuclear centrifuges, uh, spy satellites, fighter fighter jets. fighter jets. So you have to know your business and imagine, you know, how would one of these, you know, agencies be looking at you? So if you, if you produce a product could be a micro circuit, could be a, a high grade, you know, material that has that type of application. Then you have to anticipate that the U.S. government is going to be looking at you. And if it's technology, it's likely going to be someone from Robert's agency uh, where it crosses the border. Um, Homeland Security and Investigations and Customs and Border Protection will take an interest in your shipments. Um if uh, the material has application in um, in the war machine, 
uh, uh, a military application. And that doesn't just mean, you know, guns and ammo. It could mean gyroscopes or night vision or the technology used there. There's going to be from some folks from the State Department you know, who, who focus on the Arms uh, Export Control Act enforcement and the licensing regime there. They're going to be looking at your stuff and where it's going. Um, you know, the FBI uh, counterintelligence division uh, takes a strong interest in where, uh, you know, people, things and money are going overseas and who has equities uh, in those relationships, particularly with respect to countries like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea and their um, their counterparties. So I think that's the first thing you have to look at. You know, do I make stuff or do I do business with folks who might be of interest to commerce because of the technology, state because of the military application, the FBI because of the counter espionage equity, you know, uh, or Homeland Security, which is a very, very broad mission. And essentially looks at everything that crosses the border. So that that's how that's how that's how we we approached it. And then you build the team depending on on where the case is going to take you. Okay. Well, Robert, can you talk a little bit because, about the difference in uh, jurisdiction for Department of Commerce versus the Department of Treasury, and then how those two agencies work together um, to help support the the overall goal and efforts of the United States? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so as we know, the Treasury Department basically owns all the sanctions, uh, with the exception of Syria, which, uh, which Commerce will have, have the uh, sanction on. Um, but with regards to our interworking relationship with the Department of Treasury and Commerce, um, Treasury, spe- specifically OFAC, they do not have criminal investigators like uh, Commerce, Homeland Security, FBI. So as a result of that, we, there's basically a cross jurisdiction. We basically will be able to take over um, on the investigative side, when the two uh, agencies merge, um, basically what will happen is uh, it's almost like a hand in glove with regards to Treasury. Um, if they are looking at individuals or companies that are sanctions violators, uh, certainly when they are de- we are dealing with commodities that are being export con- that are uh, export controlled or going overseas to an embargo nation, what will happen is um, Treasury. Uh, if the item, excuse me, if the item is subject to export controls that fall on the commerce control list, and then the items are then being exported to a sanctioned country, that's where the kind of two merge together. So what the what special agents from commerce will do is we will take that information, um, we will see how egregious uh, the the conduct is, and and to to basically uh, to tack on what Seth was stating earlier, when we were to when we are to bring a case to the United States Attorney's Office. We are not targeting individuals or companies that are just blindly exporting items from the United States uh, and have really no idea what they're doing. On that side, as a special agent with commerce, we go out and we speak to companies and individuals and give them knowledge of the export regs so that they know exactly what's going on so that the company eventually does not wind up getting in trouble. That's part of our job on the educational side. The individuals that we are looking at that are committing these egregious offenses, both uh, with with uh, export control violations coupled with the Treasury Department, with regards to that, um, we have to find out, we have to establish what kind of knowledge and intent those individuals have of them breaking the law. So prior to us going to the U.S. Attorney's Office when Seth was, was a prosecutor, we would have to establish that these individuals were knowingly going to violate U.S. export law. Uh, knew what they were doing was against the law, knew that the items that they were sending overseas required an export license, and just decided to do it with blind regard. So whether it being items that are being uh, transshipped from from the United States through the United Arab Emirates into Iran or stuff going uh, to North Korea, wh- whatever whatever runs the gamut, these are the types of cases that we would look at. And, and based on the egregious offense, then we would decide whether or not is this case going to take an administrative uh, sanction or are we going to take it uh, criminal or sometimes both? So that's how we work hand in glove with that, with, with Treasury. Well, and Seth, Robert brings up a good point. There, there is a difference here between, um, you know, civil enforcement and criminal enforcement of these laws and regulations. Can you talk a little bit about how those work together? And, and Robert did a great job of talking about how to maybe when those decisions are made on whether to pursue it civilly versus criminally, but could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yeah. Um, and, and look, I think, 
uh, our audience are, uh, you know, is primarily, if not exclusively, one would hope, uh, folks who are acting in good faith, uh, trying to satisfy um, the expectations, you know, of the United States government and remain on the on the right side of the line. And they invest a lot of resources in that. So it's it's pretty unlikely that, you know, the folks we're working with are going to intentionally violate uh, some of these um, uh, th- these statutes. Um, but Matthew, you're, you're exactly right. On the civil enforcement side, it's not nearly so forgiving. Um, you know, OFAC, uh, for example, even in the ransomware context, has repeatedly reminded folks that if you, for example, you know, make a ransomware payment to a specially designated national, uh, someone on the OFAC list, you know, you have liability. Uh, for, for for that. Um, similarly, uh, with the Russian sanctions regime uh, that's that's been announced, um, you know, uh, corporations, you know, don't always have the benefit, you know, Robert, of you coming to the door to make sure every everything's all right. They're seeing a new announcement uh, from OVAC every few days, telling them that if they don't, you know, wind down a transaction within a few weeks, or if they engage. You know, with a counterparty who's been very, perhaps very recently uh, listed, um, they're violating the OFAC regulations and uh, momentum from the government and from the world right now is, is pretty unforgiving, I think. So while you're right, Matthew, well, a, a criminal violation takes a fairly significant, you know, mens rea, culpable mind to prosecute criminally the kind of cases that Bob's talking about. Um on the civil side, the regulatory side, it's not nearly as hard uh, to get in trouble right. uh, with the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department and OFAC, you know, are, are kind of providing the guidance, which is maybe how the Commerce Department is going to focus their attention and provide agents, you know, to work on the criminal side. Um, but there's lots of other ways, unfortunately, you know, to, to get in trouble with the government and to run afoul than uh, of the sanctions regimes and committing one of the, you know, what, what Robert, I think, quite rightly calls an egregious, willful, you know, violation of the law. Yeah, I, you know, it, you said is, you know, to run afoul of some of the civil regulations or at least commit a civil violation. I mean, I mean, again, there's not a requirement that you intended to do it. There's not a requirement that you knew you were doing it. It's a lot of times it's just like running a stop sign. Doesn't really matter why you did it. Doesn't mm-hmm. remember if I, you didn't see the stop sign. If you do it, uh, you do it. And and there are uh, there are rules in place, thankfully, on the civil side that do promote companies that that find these issues to come self report. And there is mitigation of, of fines and and uh, penalties that are going to be associated with various types of violations as well. Um, Robert, if, if you could talk a little bit about when you're out there educating companies, because, you know, uh, so a lot of these companies that are selling very high end technology are mm-hmm. selling these dual use or, or, or uh, technology or, or goods that have kind of dual applications, you know, both from a civil side and a military side, they're going to have pretty sophisticated compliance programs in mm-hmm. place, but there's a whole lot of companies that probably don't realize that they're maybe selling on goods that are subject to license requirements. uh, And they don't really have those uh, policies and procedures in place. So tell us a little bit about kind of how you approach that and and kind of what is the introduction conversation with those companies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, So Basically, when we when we go out to a company or when we go out to an individual, um, whether they are a Fortune 500 company, Fortune 100 company, or they are just a small, we call them a mom and pop exporting shop, we basically treat it all the same. We ha- what we do is we certainly we walk in and we introduce ourselves, and we'll either speak to an export manager or logistics manager, and if they, the company does not have one, then we'll actually either speak to the CEO or the vice president of the company. We'll identify ourselves, and we'll basically be there to explain why we're there. Um, the main goal of us, of our agency going out to speak with these companies is to educate them certainly about the products that they are sending out of the United States, or if there's a project they are working on, which eventually may lead to items being sent out of the United States, coupled with how the company would go about getting an export license or getting their product, their commodities classified. The Commerce Department over the last several years, based on recommendations from special agents out in the field, um, 
really has come a long way from when I first started with the Commerce Department because the expo control laws were extremely voluminous. It was almost like reading stereo instructions. And also for companies to reach out, it was almost very, very difficult. So the Commerce Department has basically streamlined uh, points of contact. Certainly when we go out, we give our car business cards and we tell them, any questions that you have, you can call our field office. And within the second ring of the phone, someone in office is picking it up. Because I know in the past, the U.S. government has gotten a bad rep of it's almost like a black hole. No, you can't get anybody on the phone. Right. right. So we make it a point to tell these companies, call our field office, second ring, someone's picking it up. And you're either speaking with me or another special agent that can help you. That coupled with the fact we also provide them with an exporter services number down at our headquarters in Washington, D.C., if they need to speak with somebody on that side. The second side is to get to, for a company to get their commodities classified. It's called the CCATS, Commodity Classification. It does not cost anything for the company. It's completely separate from the State Department where you would have to register with DDTC. Everything with the Commerce Department to include commodity classifications as well as export license are completely free. And what we do is we tell these exporters how to go on to the website how to register, get a username and a password, and then how to submit their technical specifications to get their items properly classified. What will happen is the Commerce, the Commerce Department, within probably a month, sometimes less, rare occasions, sometimes more, uh, because of COVID, things got a little slowed down, but things are kind of almost back up and running. The Commerce Department will classify your items for free. They will tell you whether or not your item has an export control classification number for that specific commodity, or they'll come back and say it falls under the caveat of VAR 99. Basically, they'll do that for each time you apply for it. And then um, on the on the back end, we will explain to them how they go about getting an export license if their product does require one to a particular country, how they go about doing it, what documents they need to submit, so that by the time the conversation is over, we will have given them the resources they need. We will uh, show them the websites. And also the other thing that over the years that has been done, um, it's called the consolidated screening list, the CSL. CSL. Um, what happens there is companies are able to go on to our website, click on the consolidated screening list, which will bring them to a page. And for free, the company or the individual can now search the company overseas to see if they show up on one of the lists, the denied parties list, the entities list, especially the designated national list. Everything has basically been combined into one list so that it's a one-stop shop. So we always tell these companies prior to them exporting something out the door, give it a quick check. The reason why I mention this is your company or an individual may have been exporting something to a company overseas for the last 30 years. And within the last two weeks, that company has now fallen out of favor with the U.S. government. And now they're on a list. You send that out. Now you're in violation of U.S. Expo law. The consolidated screening list is also updated on a biweekly basis based on everything that publishes on the Federal Register. Finally, what we do is when we do leave the company, we say, look, if you are doing an audit, if your company is coming in and you hire a firm to do an audit and you do find export violations that we have not specifically come to speak about, we tell the company how they file what's called the voluntary self-disclosure. Right. Basically, what we'll do is uh, the company will either hire a firm or they'll do it themselves. They'll come to the Commerce Department with an entire list of the violations that they've uncovered. They will provide documentation and they'll basically do a Maya culpa saying, hey, look, uh, this is not something the agents came to speak about, but we found some violations. We would like to throw ourselves on the sword. And when I tell you it is a huge mitigating factor on the criminal side, um, excuse me, on the civil side uh, that our department looks at because the company has come forward. The only time I have seen, and it's very rare, but uh, it has happened. The only time I've seen companies get in trouble is when they knowingly lie on a voluntary self-disclosure, yeah. which now... <laughs> propels it from civil to criminal investigations. And I would go see Seth at his office because now they know we, we, we've talked to them. They know the law. We told them how to disclose and they lied about it. It's very rare, but it has happened in the past. So, so rest assured, when we leave there, the company, the, we, we've basically given them everything that we have. We've poured everything out to them. And it does not happen often, but there are times a company will ask us a question that I really don't know the answer to. It, it has happened. I guarantee them that within the next day or two, we will get that answer for them and we, and we respond back. So it's, it's a very good working relationship that we have.
Yeah, and, and I'll note that if you go on to the Department of Commerce's site, and I think it's actually under BIS, there are yes. a lot of great resources um, yes. as far as um, what the Department of Commerce expects from compliance programs, talking about what the components of those programs ought to be. Um, there are uh, audit checklists on those mm -hmm. programs. Like you said, there's the consolidated screen list that's available on that website. There are a lot of good resources that are available. And OFAC also has agents and as well that you can call and, yes. and get information from as well. Um, Seth, when we were starting this, you did a, a, a nice job of talking a little bit about there's, you know, kind of this multi-phase uh, approach of looking at this. Like, you know, okay, what are you selling? And is that um, subject to any kind of regulation as far as getting a license? Who are you selling it to and where is it being sent to? Right. I mean, that's right. making it very high level and easy. Right. Um, talk a little bit about um, what companies ought to be doing on that. Who are we selling it to? Because sometimes that's not as clear as it may seem. In other words, you know, we, we'll get into a little discussion about Russian sanctions, but knowing who you're ultimately doing business with is important. So what could, Talk a little bit about what companies ought to be doing there. Yeah, I, I mean, you're 100 percent right, Matthew. You know, know your client is uh, been the mantra of uh, compliance departments. Um, you know, going back for for decades, right? It's a bedrock principle of how you do business, knowing who you're doing business with. It's harder now than it used to be, and it's especially worrisome at the in the present moment because the Russian sanctions are denying the Russian economy uh, of everything from, you know, money to, to material. And there's a high incentive now um, for the government of Russia and entities that are aligned with the government of Russia to try to essentially create new identities uh, so that they can evade uh, the diligence programs that have served corporations, you know, well up until now. And it, I don't think that's fanciful. Um, we're living in a largely digital world now. Um, you, you know, it, you face to face meetings, certainly before COVID and, and, and before the ready availability uh, of Zoom and WebEx platforms and things, you know, that was the norm. So if you were going to do a deal, you might fly uh, to the destination, you might meet with your counterparties in person, you might have a closing, you know, around a conference room table, with, you know, blue sheets down on the table where the documents would go. And you would literally uh, get to meet and know who your clients were. In an increasingly digital world, an increasing reliance on what's publicly available um, to get a sense of who your counterparty is, there are lots more opportunities to essentially create shell companies and misleading, you know, backstop is the term of art uh, for what the company uh, or platform appears to be. And so when you have a, you know, a tier one foreign state actor like the government of Russia incentivized to find new opportunities to move money and stuff, it's not crazy to think, uh, as we saw with the, you know, Iranians and the Chinese and other foreign adversaries, uh, to use shell companies that are backstopped, that appear to be geolocated in one place when they're not. To appear to be, you know, owned and controlled by a group of people, you know, when in fact they're not, to induce uh, in good faith uh, corporations to engage in transactions. So what does that mean? It really just means that our, our KYC practices have to be a little bit more sophisticated and we have to be a little bit warier when a new party is coming into a transaction who we haven't seen before. Um, you know, trust but verify. You know, as I, as, I, as I said at the outset, our clients are in the business of doing business. They're not in the business of preventing every possible, uh, you know, transaction that, that, that might not look perfect. So we have to continue to do business. But I think we're going to have to rely uh, more heavily on the, um, the industry of, frankly, third-party consultants, investigative agencies, and what are essentially private intelligence uh, outfits 
many of which are staffed with former government employees who worked in the intelligence community and who have a presence, you know, on the internet and or monitoring the incentives and activities of some of these companies so that when a new counterparty pops up in a transaction, you can say with confidence, we've done our due diligence. We've looked at the backstop. We've talked to other folks who've done business with this counterparty and we feel confident we know who we're working with. Sounds obvious, but I think it's harder today than it was two years ago, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that Seth, you and I have talked about before, and Robert, you know, I assume you would agree with this is one of the things that we've seen is that the U.S. government has done a really great job of getting, you know, really compliance professionals to help you build kind of some policies and really taking a risk-based approach at a value or looking at a compliance programs based on a risk-based approach, right? So if you are, in other words, selling very highly controlled technology, the expectations that you're going to have on doing due diligence on your customers is going to be much higher than a company that is not selling highly controlled technology. They're maybe just doing exports. And, you know, what's what's you know what you have to do in one instance versus another are, are completely different but i think at a minimum uh you know you know, highly technology uh companies they're going to have sophisticated programs in place whether it's gts or some other program that are constantly calculating you know components and doing uh, classifications and monitoring the process and doing you know real time updates on you know you know denied party list and other uh, screening technology. But at a minimum, you know, one of the things that we see is, you know, companies that aren't in that uh, world that don't have to have that sophisticated um, overlay of technology, they still need to be doing the simple thing of updating your screenings, right, on who you're doing business with. Because the, the government's doing a really nice job of, like you said, of trying to always add these um shell companies that are being used right mm -hmm. but it, you know but you and that's why you can't just do it one time when you first put that customer on your right. uh, on your system you got to be you know update updating it at a minimum very regularly so because you're going to be catching these companies um and and people are being added all the time right i mean one of the things i was looking at was you can't just look at whether who you're doing business with for instance if you're looking at the Russian sanctions, whether they're located in Russia, right? Because we see people all over the world, including, you know, infamously the owner of the Chelsea football uh, club yes. in, in the UK, he's on the list now, right? right. So um, you, you can't just be looking at where they live. Um, so no, that's a, that's a really important part. So, we, you know, we've been hitting on it for a, or teasing it for a while. Let's start jumping a little bit into the Russian sanctions and, you know, just what, you know, I, Robert, I'd be interested to, to hear your perspective on, I, I, I can only imagine this has become an enormous priority for the Department of yes. Commerce yes. as far as its enforcement arms. Yes. So could you talk a little bit about what the department is doing, what you're mm -hmm. seeing with the things you can share? I'm sure there's a lot you absolutely. can't. No, absolutely. Um, it, it's a great question. And, and, our field office and our emails have been basically inundated with industry um, within the last month. Um, and in my career being with commerce, I, the amount of export control reform and changes that have come about in the last month has been incredible because it is changing almost on a daily basis. Um, I can tell you that um, what was once um, pretty, I, I want to say it was an easier area to export items prior to the war starting, uh, items going to Russia and Ukraine, the Crime, Crimea region a little bit less. Um, within the last month, though, the Commerce Department has basically moved into a policy of denial when yeah. it comes to exporting items uh, into that area. And can you um, explain so, what that means? Sure, absolutely. So what, what happens is when, it, when an individual or a company, as I stated earlier, comes in uh, and they've been exporting their product, I'm saying, going to say product X to, to Russia for the last 10 years. Um, and either the, uh, the export license was granted or the export license was granted with some sort of, uh, 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 with some sort of um, uh, caveats on it or the license was rejected. 
Um, it was basically a back and forth between the organization or the individual and the Commerce Department with regards to getting getting their stuff overseas. In the last month and a half, the Commerce Department has basically moved to a policy of denial, which means um, unless there's items going over for humanitarian aid or medicinal purposes, if you if a company or an individual applies for an export license to send their widget over to Russia, uh, it's going to be it's probably going to be denied that export license. Um, which means now um, the bad actors are coming out and they are trying to circumvent uh, the export controls to get items over to Russia that are needed by trying to come up with other various ways to get the stuff out of the United States, meaning that they may use a different airline over at Kennedy Airport. They may use a different route or method of, 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 of uh, sending stuff by sea in, a, in an ocean going container, uh, using a third country to try and uh, re-export the items in. Um, so the one thing that is very, very important is that the answers that I give today with regards to how the sanctions are in place and what is being uh, not allowed to go, or what is to go, uh, has changed from last week. Uh, certainly now we're, we're seeing there was a ban on luxury goods as effective the other day. Um, certainly the first time in my career I've been searching Russian oligarch private jets and boats. Never had to do that before. You know, two weeks ago we were out at Teterboro Airport searching a Russian oligarch's private plane to see if there was any items on that plane subject to the regulations. And then at the same time, speaking to him and informing him that he was flying from here to the UK, we said, look, when you get to the UK, you cannot fly to Russia. Trying to explain that. You know, we let him go. The plane left. It didn't matter. As soon as he got to the UK, the UK authorities actually seized his plane because I think he was going. So with regards to if, if your client base and your and your clients are in the area of sending stuff over to, the, to Russia right now, it is an area that they have to daily, on a daily basis, take a look at what the sanctions are because they are ever changing. Uh, the longer this conflict drags on, I'm assuming more, more and more sanctions will be put in place. Certainly, we take our cues, as Seth pointed out earlier in, in the webinar, it's all based on politics. Uh, president mandates exactly how he wants this to go down, and we, we take our cues from that. So um, as it comes down, our Office of Export Analysis and our bureau chiefs, they basically set the policy in going forward. We'll get a copy of that policy, and on a daily basis, we'll react to what's going on. So it is ever-changing, but right now, uh, the bottom line is a policy of denial with items going on, with the exception of medicinal and humanitarian, and that it is something that Individuals that are, are in, engaged in exports to that area of the world right now, on a daily basis, they have to, uh, they have to uh, keep up on this. And at the end uh, of this, I will certainly provide uh, my contact information uh, through Seth in, for clients if, in case uh, they have questions. And certainly, I know your client base is throughout the United States. I could actually put those clients in touch with various agents from the other parts of the United States from commerce as well. So, But it's an ever-changing, on a daily basis, ever-changing. Yeah, it, you know, and it's not, I mean, these are really unprecedented sanctions. Uh, yes. I mean, especially going after the Central Bank of Russia, yes. Yes. taking uh, the ability to participate in the SWIFT um, process. It's mm -hmm. really been unprecedented, but it is important for people to understand that there's the the items that now require a license that didn't, is a very large number of items. It's categories three through nine. That's a lot yes. of materials. It's yes. everything from uh, sensors, navigation equipment, telecommunication items, um, components that can be used in aircraft, marine equipment. It is a very uh, large uh, amount of, uh, of items. And I think another one that really impacts a number of the clients that Seth and I deal with in the energy industry, of course, there's been um, restrictions on exports relating to deep water, mm -hmm. Arctic, and shale exploration. But now there's been um, a, a pretty significant expansion on items that are being that you're used in refining. And, and so before now, although there had been some sanctions relating to the energy industry in Russia, that's been ex substantially expanded. And so any of those items now as, as well are, are going to be uh, problematic. Um, Seth, you know, what are you, you know, what are your takeaways from the, the Russian sanctions that have been put in and, and, and what are, 
what should companies be expecting there from the enforcement side? Yeah, so so a, a couple of things. I mean, you know, we were out at the white collar conference in uh, in uh, San Francisco just a few weeks ago, and one of the notable developments there was on the dais where it was meet the regulators. Um, the head of uh, enforcement for the Commerce Department was uh, in a chair, you know, next to the SEC, you know, and the DOJ um, and the CFTC talking about enforcement, and he was quite enthusiastic about commerce, you know, leaning in, getting more aggressive on controlled technologies um, and, you know, kind of proudly trumpeting that folks should expect to see folks like Robert, you know, showing up in their in their offices and commerce is looking to make a mark. So I I hold, you know, I hold him to his word, uh, you know, when he says that we're going to see increased activity from the Commerce Department. It it also makes sense. You know, as Robert said, OFAC um, relies uh, on the Commerce Department to a, a fair degree to conduct some of the investigative work th- that will reveal the sanctions uh, violations. So I think we're going to definitely see more activity. Um, you know, as you point out, uh, Matthew, the, the government has been doing a pretty good job of informing the public, but then there's an expectation that we'll be paying attention. So, you know, you can subscribe to the OFAC update list and you will get the emails when right. they announce a new a, a new designation. You can look at the consolidated list that, you know, Robert described and you will see, uh, you know, areas of concern and issue spots. So the government has said, we're going to make this easy, but then the expectation is you better be looking at it. Um, also, I, w- I would say, you know, as you've pointed out, you know, it's... It's frankly hard to act or impossible to accidentally violate the criminal law, not impossible to run afoul, you know, just through kind of negligence or willful blindness um, on the civil and regulatory side. But a lot of the analysis we're doing is really just reputational and commercial. Right. So so you can put aside, well, you can say, yeah, I'm never going to commit a willful export violation. And yeah, I've got a good compliance department. And, and we figured out how to, how to thread the needle on these transactions. But a lot of the questions we're getting is how are the markets going to react to our continuing to do business or engaging in new business? you know, with an entity which might not be sanctioned today, but could be sanctioned tomorrow or is perceived to be in some way uh, supporting the government of of Russia. Um, And, you know, just historically, one of the cases Robert uh, worked on in our office was a case, you know, originating out of Texas where you had a company that was um, procuring microcircuits purportedly to use them in traffic lights you know, in in the United States seemed entirely innocuous. And so a lot of U.S. domestic suppliers were sending along microcircuits thinking, okay, fine, you know, they'll use them in a traffic light. Where's the harm in that? In fact, they were being exported to the government of Russia to use in the radar nose cones of Russian fighter planes. And I think most of the companies, if not all the companies that ultimately learned that they were providing microcircuits to the Russian military were mortified, right. Um, right. you know, certainly not doing it wittingly or knowingly or intentionally, but had become an unwitting, you know, support arm for the government of Russia. And I think the reputational risk associated with that right now, the commercial risk for who's going to want to do business with you. If your diligence is not good enough and you've you know, been discovered to be supporting government of Russia, I, I think that's got to be taken just as seriously by our clients as the legal risk, you know, frankly, because either one of them can, can, can really do, do injury to a company. So I think bottom line is we got to be better on the diligence. We got to pay attention to the alerts from the government, got to dig in a little bit deeper. We got to avail ourselves of the information that the government is, is providing. And we've got to do it at a tempo that keeps up with with the with the landscape, which is a pretty fast, a pretty fast tempo. So I think it can be done. I think we're doing it right now. But it's um, it's it's definitely a, a time to maintain a high level of vigilance because the potential potential risks are, are just are just quite high right now, I think, for a misstep. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and it's going to be hard, I think. Robert, for um, for the the government to be um, less forgiving of violations, or at least violations that aren't what I would view as a foot fault, because mm-hmm. this has become such an we talked about unprecedented sanctions. Yes, it's been a focus of the world. 
Um, you know, you, you know, uh, politicians don't seem to agree on a whole lot, but they do largely agree on yes. um, the sanctions regime against uh, Russia here. And so there's so much momentum towards uh, ensuring that Russia is cut off and so that it, it can't continue this uh, humanitarian uh, nightmare that we're seeing on a daily basis. Um, so that, you know, companies really got to be careful here. Um, are, are, are you seeing it or is the Department of Commerce already seeing people coming in to self-report or are you just seeing more questions right now? Right now, um, the majority has been questions, um, a lot of emails, and, it, and it's good. Uh, it's a lot of companies that we have a working relationship with that we've gone out and we've spoken with. We've given them our contact information, have come forward. Even export attorneys that we have dealt with in the past um, have almost on a daily basis, been asking us for guidance. Uh, certainly our guidance is, you know, uh, to, to, to look at the rigs that have been posted and coupled with a uh, talk to our export of services department down at headquarters, which is geared in on, because that's what we, we always want to give them advice, but we want to steer them in, in the best direction that we can, because right. at the end of the day, we're investigators and we want to be able to, to point them to the direction of, of, of the policy makers. Um, so the questions have been coming in fast quickly on a daily basis and and on our side as well with everything that's going on we're trying to to learn about it and keep up with it too you know what was not controlled yesterday is controlled today what could go out yesterday can't go out today so it it's a it's a it's a learning learning for us as well and, and as Seth pointed out a minute ago it's extremely fast uh you know we are conducting operations now um totally different than we did a month ago you know or two months ago prior to the war starting so Gear, as as politics dictate our gears towards our operations shift, um, what was a month and a half ago trying to get ghost guns that are being exported to the Caribbean, which was a forefront because of you know all, all the gun problems here in, in the states, that kind of right now has taken a backseat to hey we, 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 Russia's on the forefront right now, so oh, everything everything is changing. Yeah, absolutely. And but we are we are doing our best to inform our exporting community that comes out and asks us the questions. We are filling in the gaps that they don't know the answers to at the same time learning uh, as well, because it, it, everything's changing. So it's, it's, it's quick pace. Something, as I said, in the 20 years that I've been with commerce, this is, this is a first for me too, as well. So. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Seth, do you have any final words today? No, just that, uh, you know, we're going to continue to monitor this. Of, of course, I think, you know, the messaging in the sanctions area and from the Commerce Department syncs up uh, quite neatly, you know, Matthew, with what we've heard from the Justice Department, you know, since the fall, that the Justice Department was going to be take a, taking a harder look at corporations, how they were doing business internationally. They were going to be, you know, emphasizing a prosecution of, uh, of both corporations when appropriate and individuals, lots more oversight and scrutiny. So I think where you've got, you know, commerce and OFAC, the sanctions regime, and then you've got DOJ beating the drum on higher accountability just generally for both domestic and international activity uh, by, by U.S. corporations. I think it's all navigable, but I think, I think the, um, the landscape has become more challenging I think now for, for companies to say with confidence uh, that they will meet or exceed the expectations of the regulators and the enforcers. And so, you know, as, as always, it's our job to really just help folks, you know, stay out of trouble uh, and project that confidence, you know, at the first call. But I, I have seen the landscape change. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, I think it's for companies that have compliance programs. And, and look, it, you know, it's a, it's a cost issue. Um, those, you know, with the pandemic and the, uh, f the fallout from that and, and uh, companies having supply chain problems and uh, that's created a lot of strain on companies from a revenue st standpoint and in yeah. compliance, you know, it is a, you know, it is a cost center, but, you know, companies need to make sure that they're focused on it and companies that have those programs, the government has made it very clear that, you know, reviewing those programs, updating them, f doing risk assessments, make sure that if you have holes in your program that you're, you're taking care of those, either you find them through, you know, violations or you find it through an audit. And for companies that don't have programs, they need to make sure they have them, right? And, and again, risk-based approach, there's not a one size that fits all here, right? but, you know, 
I imagine if Robert comes knocking at your door because you sold something to somebody you shouldn't, saying that we don't have a program in place is is not a real good answer if you're doing business internationally. So, yeah, um, and I expect you might Robert might return next year uh, to to see what's changed. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, there's efficient ways to do all this, um, but I think once you're on notice, Matthew, you're 100 percent right. It's uh, it, once you're on notice, um, then it's much harder to explain later. Why, why the status quo remained. That's right. Well, guys, thank you so much for this. Robert, this has been fantastic. You know, uh, our clients and, and, and people that we, and friends of the firm, they, they always love hearing insights from people that are fighting this on the forefront. And, and thank you for your work that you're doing for the U.S. And uh, we appreciate it. And we'll, we'll provide your uh, contact information. And I'm sure people will be taking you up on on this. And Seth, thank you always for your great insights of marrying your government experience with your, your experience as a, a, a private lawyer now. So uh, thank you for joining us. And if you uh, have any questions, please feel free to follow up with Seth or I or anyone else in our government enforcement investigation practice. And we'll be putting out additional episodes as as things develop. Thank you.